Chapter Twenty One of the Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Chapter Twenty One. Jem, come out here," called Edwards at the window of Mister Wells' cabin. The young man arose from the breakfast table and when outside found edward standing by the door with an indian brave he was a wyandot lightly built lithe and wiry easily recognizable as an indian runner when jim appeared the man handed him a small packet he unwound a few folds of some oily skin to find a square piece of birch bark upon which were scratched the following words rev j downs greeting your brother is alive and safe whispering winds rescued him by taking him as her husband leave the village of peace pipe and half king have been influenced by gertie zane now what do you think of that exclaimed jim handing the message to edwards thank heaven joe was saved zane that must be the zane who married tarhe's daughter answered edwards when he had read the note i'm rejoiced to hear of your brother joe married to that beautiful indian maiden well of all wonderful things mused jim what will nell say we're getting warnings enough do you appreciate that asked edwards pipe and half king have been influenced by gertie evidently the writer deemed that brief sentence of sufficient meaning edwards we're preachers we can't understand such things i am learning at least something every day Colonel Zane advised us not to come here. Wetzel said, go back to Fort Henry. Gertie warned us, and now comes this peremptory order from Isaac Zane. Well? It means that these border men see what we will not admit. We ministers have such hope and trust in God that we cannot realize the dangers of this life. I fear that our work has been in vain. Never. We have already saved many souls. Do not be discouraged. All this time the runner had stood near at hand, straight as an arrow. Presently Edward suggested that the Wyandot was waiting to be questioned, and accordingly he asked the Indian if he had anything further to communicate. Yorong go by pale face. Here he held up both hands and shut his fists several times, evidently enumerating how many white men he had seen. Here, when high sun with that he bounded lightly past them and loped off with an even swinging stride what did he mean asked jim almost sure he had not heard the runner aright he meant that a party of white men are approaching and will be here by noon i never knew an indian runner to carry unreliable information we have joyful news both in regard to your brother and the village of peace let us go in to tell the others the Huron runner's report proved to be correct. Shortly before noon, signals from Indian scouts proclaimed the approach of a band of white men. Evidently, Gertie's forces had knowledge beforehand of the proximity of this band, for the signals created no excitement. The Indians expressed only a lazy curiosity. Soon several Delaware scouts appeared, escorting a large party of frontiersmen. These men turned out to be Captain Williamson's force, which had been out on an expedition after a marauding tribe of Chippewas. This last-named tribe had recently harried the remote settlers and committed depredations on the outskirts of the white settlements eastward. The company was composed of men who had served in the garrison at Fort Pitt, and hunters and backwoodsmen from Yellow Creek and Fort Henry. The captain himself was a typical border man, rough and bluff, hardened by long years of border life, and like most pioneers having no more use for an indian than for a snake he had led his party after the marauders and surprised and slaughtered nearly all of them returning eastward he had passed through Gashoting, where he learned of the muttering storm rising over the village of peace and had come more out of curiosity than hope to avert misfortune the advent of so many frontiersmen seemed a godsend to the perplexed and worried missionaries. They welcomed the newcomers most heartily. Beds were made in several of the newly erected cabins. The village was given over for the comfort of the frontiersmen. Edwards conducted Captain Williamson through the shops and schools, 
and the old borderman's weather-beaten face expressed a comical surprise. "'Well, I'll be durned if I ever expected to see a redskin work,' was his only comment on the industries. "'We are greatly alarmed by the presence of Gertie and his followers,' said Edwards. "'We have been warned to leave, but have not been actually threatened. "'What do you infer from the appearance here of these hostile savages?' it hardly appears to me they'll bother you preachers there are again the christian redskins that's plain why have you been warned to go well that's natural seeing there are again the preaching or well, what will they do with the converted indians mighty uncertain they might let them go back to the tribes but appears to me these good injuns won't go another thing gertie is afeard of the spread of christianity then you think our Christians will be made prisoners? Pears likely. And you also think we'd do well to leave here? I do, sartin. We're sartin for Fort Henry soon. You'd better come along with us. Captain Williamson, we're going to stick it out, Gertie or no Gertie. You can't do no good staying here. Pipe and Half King won't stand for the singing, praying redskins, especially when they've got all these cattle and fields of grain. Wetzel said the same. Have you seen Wetzel? Yes, he rescued a girl from Jim Gertie and returned her to us. That's so. I met Wetzel and Jack Zane back a few miles in the woods. They're laying for somebody, because when I asked them to come along, they refused, saying they had work as must be done. They looked like it, too. I never heard tell of Wetzel advising anyone before, but... I'll say if he told me to do a thing, by gosh, I'd do it. As men, we might very well take the advice given us. But as preachers, we must stay here to do all we can for these Christian Indians. One more thing. Will you help us? I reckon I'll stay here to see the thing out, answered Williamson. Edwards made a mental note of the frontiersman's evasive answer. Jim had meanwhile made the acquaintance of a young minister, John Christie by name, who had lost his sweetheart in one of the Chippewa raids, and had accompanied the Williamson expedition in the hope he might rescue her. "'How long have you been out?' asked Jim. "'About four weeks now,' answered Christie. "'My betrothed was captured five weeks ago yesterday. I joined Williamson's band, which made up at Short Creek, to take the trail of the flying Chippewas.' in the hope I might find her. But not a trace. The expedition fell upon a band of redskins over on the wall haunting, and killed nearly all of them. I learned from a wounded Indian that a renegade had made off with a white girl about a week previous. Perhaps it was poor Lucy. Jim related the circumstances of his own capture by Jim Gertie, the rescue of Nell, and Kate's sad fate. "'Could Jim Gertie have gotten your girl?' inquired Jim, in conclusion. "'It's hardly probable. The description doesn't tally with Gertie's. This renegade was short and heavy, and noted especially for his strength. Of course, an Indian would first speak of some such distinguishing feature. There are, however, ten or twelve renegades on the border, and excepting Jim Gertie, one's as bad as another.' Then it's a common occurrence, this abducting girls from the settlements. Yes, and the strange thing is that one never hears of such doings until he gets out on the frontier. For that matter, you don't hear much of anything except of the wonderful richness and promise of the western country. You are right. Rumors of fat, fertile lands induce the colonist to become a pioneer. He comes west with his family. Two out of every ten lose their scalps, and in some places the average is much greater. The wives, daughters, and children are carried off into captivity. I have been on the border two years, and know that the rescue of any captive, as Wetzel rescued your friend, is a remarkable exception. If you have so little hope of recovering your sweetheart, what then is your motive for accompanying this band of hunters? Revenge. And you are a preacher? Jim's voice did not disguise his astonishment. "'I was a preacher, and now I am thirsting for vengeance,' answered Christie, his face clouding darkly. "'Wait until you learn what frontier life means. You are young here yet, 
you are flushed with the success of your teaching you have lived a short time in this quiet village where until the last few days all has been serene you know nothing of the strife of the necessity of fighting of the cruelty which makes up this border existence only two years have hardened me so that i actually pant for the blood of the renegade who has robbed me a frontiersman must take his choice of succumbing or cutting his way through flesh and bone blood will be spilled if not yours then your foes the pioneers run from the plough to the fight they halt in the cutting of corn to defend themselves and in winter must battle against cold and hardship which would be less cruel if there was time in summer to prepare for winter for the savages leave them hardly an opportunity to plant crops how many pioneers have given up and gone back east find me any who would not return home to-morrow if they could all that brings them out here is a chance for a home and all that keeps them out here is the poor hope of finally attaining their object always there is a possibility of future prosperity but this generation if it survives will never see prosperity and happiness what does this border life engender in a pioneer who holds his own in it of all things not christianity he becomes a fighter keen as the redskin who steals through the coverts the serene days of the village of peace had passed into history soon that depraved vagabond the french trader with cheap trinkets and vile whisky made his appearance this was all that was needed to inflame the visitors where they had been only bold and impudent they became insulting and abusive they execrated the christian indians for their neutrality scorned them for worshipping this unknown god and denounced a religion which made women of strong men the slaughtering of cattle commenced the despoiling of maize fields and robbing of corn cribs began with the drunkenness all this time it was seen that gertie and elliot consulted often with pipe and half king the latter was the only huron chief opposed to neutrality toward the village of peace and he was if possible more fierce in his hatred than pipe the future of the christian settlement rested with these two chiefs gertie and elliot evidently were the designing schemers and they worked diligently on the passions of these simple-minded but fierce warlike chiefs greatly to the relief of the distracted missionaries heckwelder returned to the village jaded and haggard he presented a travel-worn appearance he made the astonishing assertions that he had been thrice waylaid and assaulted on his way to goshocking then detained by a roving band of chippewas and soon after his arrival at their camping ground a renegade had run off with a white woman captive while the indians west of the village were in an uproar zeisberger however was safe in the moravian town of salem some miles west of goshocking heckwelder had expected to find the same condition of affairs as existed in the village of peace but he was bewildered by the great array of hostile indians chiefs who had once extended friendly hands to him now drew back coldly as they said washington is dead the american armies are cut to pieces the few thousands who had escaped the british are collecting at fort pitt to steal the indians land heckwelder vigorously denied all these assertions knowing they had been invented by gertie and elliot he exhausted all his skill and patience in the vain endeavor to show pipe where he was wrong half king had been so well coached by the renegades that he refused to listen the other chiefs maintained a cold reserve that was baffling and exasperating wingenund took no active part in the councils but his presence apparently denoted that he had sided with the others the outlook was altogether discouraging i am completely fagged out declared heckwelder that night when he returned to edward's cabin he dropped into a chair as one whose strength is entirely spent whose indomitable spirit has at last been broken lie down to rest said edwards oh i can't matters look so black you're tired out and discouraged you'll feel better to-morrow the situation is not perhaps so hopeless the presence of these frontiersmen should encourage us what will they do what 
can they do cried heckwelder bitterly i tell you never before have i encountered such gloomy stony indians it seems to me that they are in no vacillating state they act like men whose course is already decided upon and who are only waiting for what asked jim after a long silence god only knows perhaps for a time possibly for a final decision and it may be for a reason the very thought of which makes me faint tell us said edwards speaking quietly for he had ever been the calmest of the missionaries never mind perhaps it's only my nerves i'm all unstrung and could suspect anything to-night heckwelder tell us jim asked earnestly my friends i pray i am wrong god help us if my fears are correct i believe the indians are waiting for jim girty end of chapter twenty one of the spirit of the border by zane gray recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio twenty two of the spirit of the border by zane gray this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Leonard Wilson. Chapter 22 Simon Gertie lolled on a blanket in Half King's teepee. He was alone, awaiting his allies. Rings of white smoke curled lazily from his lips as he puffed on a long Indian pipe and gazed out over the clearing that contained the village of peace still water has something in its placid surface significant of deep channels of hidden depths the dim outline of the forest is dark with meaning suggestive of its wild internal character so simon gertie's hard bronzed face betrayed the man his degenerate brother's features were revolting but his own were striking and fell short of being handsome only because of their craggy hardness years of revolt of bitterness of consciousness of wasted life had graven their stern lines on that copper mask-like face yet despite the cruelty there the forbidding shade on it as if a reflection from a dark soul it was not wholly a bad countenance traces still lingered faintly of a man in whom kindlier feelings had once predominated in a moment of pique, Gertie had deserted his military post at Fort Pitt and become an outlaw of his own volition. Previous to that time, he had been an able soldier and a good fellow. When he realized that his step was irrevocable and that even his best friends condemned him, he plunged with anger and despair in his heart into a war upon his own race. Both of his brothers had long been border ruffians whose only protection from the outraged pioneers lay in the faraway camps of hostile tribes. George Gertie had so sunk his individuality into the savages that he was no longer a white man. Jim Gertie stalked over the borderland with a bloody tomahawk, his long arm outstretched to clutch some unfortunate white woman, and with his hideous smile of death. Both of these men were far lower than the worst savages, and it was almost wholly to their deeds of darkness that Simon Gertie owed his infamous name. Today, White Chief, as Gertie was called, awaited his men. A slight tremor of the ground caused him to turn his gaze. The Huron Chief, Half King, resplendent in his magnificent array, had entered the teepee. He squatted in a corner, rested the bowl of his great pipe on his knee, and smoked in silence the habitual frown of his black brow like a shaded overhanging cliff the fire flashing from his eyes as a shining light is reflected from a dark pool his closely shut bulging jaw all bespoke a nature lofty in its indian pride and arrogance but more cruel than death another chief stalked into the tepee and seated himself it was pipe his countenance denoted none of the intelligence that made Wingenund's face so noble. It was even coarser than half-king's, and his eyes, resembling live coals in the dark, the long, cruel lines of his jaw, 
the thin, tightly closed lips, which looked as if they could relax only to utter a savage command, expressed fierce cunning and brutality. White chief is idle today, said Half King, speaking in the Indian tongue. King, I am waiting. Gertie is slow, but sure, answered the renegade. The eagle sails slowly round and round, up and up, replied Half King with majestic gestures, until his eye sees all, until he knows his time. Then he folds his wings and swoops down from the blue sky like the forked fire. So does White Chief. But Half King is impatient. Today decides the fate of the village of peace, answered Gertie imperturbably. Ah, oh, grunted Pipe. Half King vented his approval in the same meaning exclamation. An hour passed. The renegades smoked in silence. The chiefs did likewise. A horseman rode up to the door of the teepee, he dismounted, and came in. It was Elliot. He had been absent twenty hours. His buckskin suit showed the effect of hard riding through the thickets. "'Hello, Bill, any sign of Jim?' was Gertie's greeting to his lieutenant. "'Nary, he's not been seen near the Delaware camp. He's after that chap who married Wins.' "'I thought so. Jim's rounding up a tenderfoot who will be a bad man to handle if he has half a chance. I saw as much the day he took his horse away from Silver. He finally did for the Shawnee, and almost put Jim out.' My brother oughtn't to give rein to personal revenge at a time like this. Gertie's face did not change, but his tone was one of annoyance. Well, Jim said he'd be here today, didn't he? Today is as long as we allowed to wait. He'll come. Where's Jake and Mac? They're here somewhere, drinking like fish and raising hell. Two more renegades appeared at the door, and entering the teepee squatted down in Indian fashion. The little wiry man with a wizened face was McKee. The other was the latest acquisition to the renegade force, Jake Deering, deserter, thief, murderer, everything that is bad. In appearance he was of medium height, but very heavily, compactly built, and evidently as strong as an ox. He had a tangled shock of red hair, a broad, bloated face, big dull eyes like the openings of empty furnaces, and an expression of beastliness. Deering and McKee were intoxicated. "'Bad time for drinking,' said Gertie, with disapproval in his glance. Well, "'That's that to you,' growled Deering. "'I'm here to do your work, and I reckon it'll be done better if I'm drunk.' "'Don't get careless,' replied Gertie, with that cool tone and dark look, such as dangerous men use. I'm only saying it's a bad time for you, because if this bunch of frontiersmen happened to get on to you being the renegade that was with the Chippewas and got that young feller's girl, there's liable to be trouble. They ain't a going to find out. Where is she? Back there in the woods. Maybe it's as well. Now don't get so drunk you blab all you know. We've lots of work to do without having to clean up Williamson's bunch rejoined Gertie. Bill, tie up the tent flaps, and we'll get to council. Elliot arose to carry out the order, and had pulled in the deer hide flaps, when one of them was jerked outward to disclose the befrilled person of Jem Gertie. Except for a discoloration over his eye, he appeared as usual. Ah, grunted Pipe, who was glad to see his renegade friend. Half King evinced the same feeling. Hello, was Simon Gertie's greeting. "'Pears I'm on time for the picnic,' said Jim Curdy, with his ghastly leer. Bill Elliott closed the flaps after giving orders to the guard to prevent any Indians from loitering near the teepee. "'Listen,' said Simon Gertie, speaking low in the Delaware language, "'the time is ripe. We've come here to break forever the influence of the white man's religion. Our councils have been held. We shall drive away the missionaries and burn the village of peace.' He paused, leaning forward in his exceeding earnestness, with his bronzed face lined by swelling veins, his whole person made rigid by the murderous thought. Then he hissed between his teeth, What shall we do with these Christian Indians? Pipe raised his war club, struck it upon the ground, then handed it to Half King. 
Half King took the club and repeated the action. Both chiefs favored the death penalty. Feed them to their buzzards, croaked Jim Girty. Simon Girty knitted his brow in thought. The question of what to do with the converted Indians had long perplexed him. No, said he. Let us drive away the missionaries, burn the village, and take the Indians back to camp. We'll keep them there. They'll soon forget. Pipe does not want them, declared the Delaware. Western Injuns shall never sit around half King's fire, cried the Huron. Simon Girty knew the crisis had come, that but few moments were left him to decide as to the disposition of the Christians, and he thought seriously. Certainly he did not want the Christians murdered. However cruel his life and great his misdeeds, he was still a man. If possible, he desired to burn the village and ruin the religious influence, but without shedding blood. Yet with all his power, he was handicapped, and that by the very chiefs most nearly under his control. He could not subdue this growing Christian influence without the help of Pipe and Half-King. To these savages, a thing was either right or wrong. He had sown the seed of unrest and jealousy in the savage breasts, and the fruit was the decree of death. As far as these Indians were concerned, this decision was unalterable. On the other hand, if he did not spread ruin over the village of peace, the missionaries would soon get such a grasp on the tribes that their hold would never be broken. He could not allow that even if he was forced to sacrifice the missionaries along with their converts, for he saw in the growth of this religion his own downfall. The border must be hostile to the whites, or it could no longer be his home. To be sure, he had aided the British in the revolution, and could find a refuge among them. But this did not suit him. He became an outcast because of failure to win the military promotion which he had so much coveted. He had failed among his own people. He had won a great position in an alien race, and he loved his power. To sway men, Indians, if not others, to his will, to avenge himself for the fancied wrong done to him, to be great, had been his unrelenting purpose. He knew he must sacrifice the Christians, or eventually lose his own power. He had no false ideas about the converted Indians. He knew they were innocent, that they were a thousand times better off than the pagan Indians, that they had never harmed him, nor would they ever do so. But if he allowed them to spread their religion, there was an end of Simon Girty. His decision was characteristic of the man. He would sacrifice anyone, or all, to retain his supremacy. He knew the fulfillment of the decree as laid down by Pipe and Half-King would be known as his work. His name, infamous now, would have an additional horror, and ever be remembered by posterity in unspeakable loathing, in unsoftening wrath. He knew this, and deep down in his heart awoke a numbed chord of humanity that twinged with strange pain. What awful work he must sanction! to keep his vaunted power. More bitter than all was the knowledge that to retain this hold over the Indians he must commit a deed which, so far as the whites were concerned, would take away his great name and brand him a coward. He briefly reviewed his stirring life, singularly fitted for a leader. In a few years he had risen to the most powerful position on the border. He wielded more influence than any chief, he had been opposed to the invasion of the pioneers, and this alone, without his sagacity or his generalship, would have given him control of many tribes. But hatred for his own people, coupled with unerring judgment, a remarkable ability to lead expeditions, and his invariable success, had raised him higher and higher until he stood alone. He was the most powerful man west of the Alleghenies. His fame was such that the British had importuned him to help them, and had actually, in more than one instance, given him command over British subjects. All of which meant that he had a great, even though an infamous, name. No matter what he was blamed for, 
no matter how many dastardly deeds had been committed by his depraved brothers and laid to his door he knew he had never done a cowardly act that which he had committed while he was drunk he considered as having been done by the liquor and not by the man he loved his power and he loved his name in all gertie's eventful ignoble life neither the alienation from his people the horror they ascribed to his power nor the sacrifice of his life to stand high among the savage races nor any of the cruel deeds committed while at war hurt him a tithe as much as did this sanctioning the massacre of the christians although he was a vengeful unscrupulous evil man he had never acted the coward half king waited long for gertie to speak since he remained silent the wily huron suggested that they take a vote on the question let us burn the village of peace drive away the missionaries and take the christians back to the delaware towns all without spilling blood said gertie determined to carry his point if possible i say the same added elliot refusing the war club held out to him by half king me too voted mckee not so drunk but that he understood the lightning-like glance gertie shot at him kill them all kill everybody cried deering in drunken glee he took the club and pounded with it on the ground pipe repeated his former performance as also did half king after which he handed the black knotted symbol of death to jim gertie three had declared for saving the christians and three for the death penalty six pairs of burning eyes were fastened on the death's head pipe and half king were coldly relentless deering awoke to a brutal earnestness mckee and elliot watched with bated breath these men had formed themselves into a tribunal to decide on the life or death of many and the situation if not the greatest in their lives certainly was one of vital importance simon gertie cursed all the fates he dared not openly oppose the voting and he could not before those cruel but just chiefs try to influence his brother's vote as jim gertie took the war club simon read in his brother's face the doom of the converted indians and he muttered to himself now tremble and shrink all you christians jim was not in a hurry slowly he poised the war club he was playing as a cat plays with a mouse he was glorying in his power the silence was that of death it signified the silence of death the war club descended with violence feed the christians to the buzzards end of chapter twenty two of the spirit of the border by zane gray recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio chapter twenty three of the spirit of the border by zane gray this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by leonard wilson i've been here before said joe to whispering winds i remember that vine-covered stone we crawled over it to get at gertie and silvertip there's the little knoll here's the very spot where i was hit by a flying tomahawk yes and there's the spring let me see what did wetzel call this spot beautiful spring answered the indian girl that's it and it's well named what a lovely place nature had been lavish in the beautifying of this enclosed dell it was about fifty yards wide and nestled among little wooded knolls and walls of gray lichen-colored stone though the sun shone brightly into the opening and the rain had free access to the mossy ground no stormy winds ever entered this well-protected glade joe reveled in the beauty of the scene even while he was too weak to stand erect he suffered no pain from his wound although he had gradually grown dizzy and felt as if the ground was rising before him he was glad to lie upon the mossy ground in the little cavern under the cliff upon examination his wound was found to have opened and was bleeding his hunting coat was saturated with blood whispering winds washed the cut 
and dressed it with cooling leaves. Then she rebandaged it tightly with Joe's linsey handkerchiefs, and while he rested comfortably, she gathered bundles of ferns, carrying them to the little cavern. When she had a large quantity of these, she sat down near Joe and began to weave the long stems into a kind of screen. The fern stalks were four feet long and half a foot wide. These she deftly laced together, making broad screens which would serve to ward off the night dews. This done, she next built a fireplace with flat stones. She found wild apples, plums, and turnips on the knoll above the glade. Then she cooked strips of meat which had been brought with them. Lance grazed on the long grass just without the glade, and Mose caught two rabbits. When darkness settled down, whispering winds called the dog within the cavern and hung the screens before the opening. Several days passed. Joe rested quietly and began to recover strength. Besides the work of preparing the meals, Whispering Winds had nothing to do save sit near the invalid and amuse or interest him so that he would not fret or grow impatient while his wound was healing. They talked about their future prospects. After visiting the village of peace, they would go to Fort Henry, where Joe could find employment. They dwelt upon the cabin they would build, and passed many happy moments planning a new home. Joe's love of the wilderness had in no wise diminished but a blow on his head from a heavy tomahawk and a vicious stab in the back had lessened his zeal so far that he understood it was not wise to sacrifice life for the pleasures of the pathless woods he could have the last without the danger of being shot at from behind every tree he reasoned that it would be best for him to take his wife to fort henry there find employment and devote his leisure time to roaming in the forest Will the pale faces be kind to an Indian who has learned to love them? Whispering winds asked wistfully of Joe. Indeed they will, answered Joe, and he told her the story of Isaac Zane, how he took his Indian bride home, how her beauty and sweetness soon won all the white people's love. It will be so with you, my wife. Whispering winds knows so little, she murmured. Why, you are learning every day and even if such was not the case you know enough for me whispering winds will be afraid she fears a little to go i'll be glad when we can be on the move said joe with his old impatient desire for action how soon winds can we set off as many days answered the indian girl holding up five fingers so long i want to leave this place leave beautiful spring yes even this sweet place it has a horror for me i'll never forget the night i first saw that spring shining in the moonlight it was right above the rock that i looked into the glade the moon was reflected in the dark pool and as i gazed into the shadowy depths of the dark water i suddenly felt an unaccountable terror but i oughtn't to have the same feeling now we are safe are we not we are safe murmured whispering winds yet i have the same chill of fear whenever i look at the beautiful spring and at night as i awake to hear the soft babble of running water i freeze until my heart feels like cold lead winds i'm not a coward but i can't help this feeling perhaps it's only the memory of that awful night with wetzel an indian feels so when he passes to his unmarked grave answered winds gazing solemnly at him whispering winds does not like this fancy of yours let us leave beautiful spring you are almost well ah oh, if whispering winds should lose you i love you and i love you my beautiful wild flower answered joe stroking the dark head so near his own a tender smile shone on his face. He heard a slight noise without the cave, and looking up, saw that which caused the smile to fade quickly. Moose! he called sharply. The dog was away chasing rabbits. Whispering winds glanced over her shoulder with a startled cry, which ended in a scream, 
not two yards behind her stood jem girty hideous was his face in its triumphant ferocity he held a long knife in his hand and snarling like a mad wolf he made a forward lunge joe raised himself quickly but almost before he could lift his hand in defense the long blade was sheathed in his breast slowly he sank back his gray eyes contracting with the old steely flash the will to do was there but the power was gone forever remember dirty murderer i am wetzel's friend he cried gazing at his slayer with unutterable scorn then the gray eyes softened and sought the blanched face of the stricken maiden winds he whispered faintly she was as one frozen with horror the gray eyes gazed into hers with lingering tenderness then the film of death came upon them the renegade raised his bloody knife and bent over the prostrate form whispering winds threw herself upon gertie with the blind fury of a maddened lioness cursing fiercely he stabbed her once twice three times she fell across the body of her lover and clasped it convulsively gertie gave one glance at his victims deliberately wiped the gory knife on wen's leggings and with another glance hurried and fearful around the glade he plunged into the thicket an hour passed a dark stream crept from the quiet figures toward the spring it dyed the moss and the green violet leaves slowly it wound its way to the clear water dripping between the pale blue flowers the little fall below the spring was no longer snowy white blood had tinged it red a dog came bounding into the glade he leaped the brook hesitated on the bank and lowered his nose to sniff at the water he bounded up the bank to the cavern a long mournful howl broke the wilderness's quiet another hour passed the birds were silent the insects still the sun sank behind the trees and the shades of evening gathered the ferns on the other side of the glade trembled a slight rustle of dead leaves disturbed the stillness the dog whined then barked the tall form of a hunter rose out of the thicket and stepped into the glade with his eyes bent upon moccasin tracks in the soft moss the trail he had been following led him to this bloody spring i might have known it he muttered wetzel for it was he leaned upon his long rifle while his keen eyes took in the details of the tragedy the whining dog the bloody water the motionless figures lying in a last embrace told the sad story joe and winds he muttered only a moment did he remain lost in sad reflection a familiar moccasin print in the sand on the bank pointed westward he examined it carefully two hours gone he muttered i might overtake him then his motions became swift with two blows of his tomahawk he secured a long piece of grapevine he took a heavy stone from the bed of the brook he carried joe to the spring and returning for winds placed her beside her lover this done he tied one end of the grapevine around the stone and wound the other about the dead bodies he pushed them off the bank into the spring as the lovers sank into the deep pool they turned exposing first wind's sad face and then joe's then they sank out of sight little waves splashed on the shore of the pool the ripple disappeared and the surface of the spring became tranquil wetzel stood one moment over the watery grave of the maiden who had saved him and the boy who had loved him in the gathering gloom his stalwart form assumed gigantic proportions and when he raised his long arm and shook his clenched fist toward the west he resembled a magnificent statue of dark menace with a single bound he cleared the pool and then sped out of the glade he urged the dog on gertie's trail and followed the eager beast toward the west as he disappeared a long low sound like the sigh of the night wind swelled and moaned through the gloom 
End of chapter 23 of The Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio Four of The Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Chapter 24 When the first ruddy rays of the rising sun crimsoned the eastern sky, Wetzel slowly wound his way down a rugged hill far west of Beautiful Spring. A white dog, weary and footsore, limped by his side. Both man and beast showed evidence of severe exertion. The hunter stopped in a little cave under a projecting stone, and laying aside his rifle, began to gather twigs and sticks. He was particular about selecting the wood, and threw aside many pieces which would have burned well. But when he did kindle a flame, it blazed hotly, yet made no smoke. He sharpened a green stick, and taking some strips of meat from his pocket, roasted them over the hot flame. He fed the dog first. Mose had crouched close on the ground, with his head on his paws, and his brown eyes fastened upon the hunter. "'He had too big a start for us,' said Wetzel, speaking as if the dog were human. It seemed that Wetzel's words were a protest against the meaning in those large, sad eyes. Then the hunter put out the fire, and searching for a more secluded spot, finally found one on top of the ledge, where he commanded a good view of his surroundings. The weary dog was asleep. Wetzel settled himself to rest, and was soon wrapped in slumber. About noon he awoke. He arose, stretched his limbs, and then took an easy position on the front of the ledge, where he could look below. Evidently the hunter was waiting for something. The dog slept on. It was the noonday hour when the stillness of the forest almost matched that of midnight. The birds were more quiet than at any other time during daylight. Wetzel reclined there with his head against the stone, and his rifle resting across his knees. He listened now to the sounds of the forest, the soft breeze fluttering among the leaves, the rain call of the tree frog, the caw of crows from distant hilltops, the sweet songs of the thrush and oriole were blended together naturally, harmoniously. But suddenly the hunter raised his head. A note, deeper than the others, a little too strong, came from far down the shaded hollow. To Wetzel's trained ear, it was a discord. He manifested no more than this attention, for the bird call was the signal he had been awaiting. He whistled a note in answer that was as deep and clear as the one which had roused him. Moments passed. There was no repetition of the sound. The songs of the other birds had ceased. Besides Wetzel, there was another intruder in the woods. Mose lifted his shaggy head and growled. The hunter patted the dog. In a few minutes the figure of a tall man appeared among the laurels down the slope. He stopped while gazing up at the ledge. Then with noiseless step he ascended the ridge, climbed the rocky ledge, and turned the corner of the stone to face Wetzel. The newcomer was Jonathan Zane. "'Jack, I expected you afore this,' was Wetzel's greeting. "'I couldn't make it sooner,' answered Zane. "'After we left Williamson and separated, I got turned around by a band of several hundred redskins making for the village of peace. I went back again, but couldn't find any sign of the trail we're hunting. Then I makes for this meeting place. I've been going for some ten hours, and I'm hungry.' "'I've got some bow already cooked,' said Wetzel, handing Zane several strips of meat. "'What luck did you have?' "'I found Gertie's trail and old one, over here some eighteen or twenty miles, and followed it until I went almost into the Delaware town. It led to a hut in a deep ravine. I ain't often surprised, but I was then. I found the dead body of that girl, Kate Wells, we fetched over from Fort Henry.' That's sad, but it ain't the surprising part. I also found Silvertip, the Shawnee I've been looking for. He was all knocked and cut up, deader than a stone. There'd been something of a scrap in the hut. 
I calculate Gertie murdered Kate, but I couldn't think then who did for Silver, though I allowed the renegade might have done that too. I watched round and seen Gertie come back to the hut. He had ten engines with him, and presently they all made for the west. I trailed him, but didn't calculate it'd be wise to tackle the bunch single-handed, so laid back. A mile or so from the hut I came across horse tracks mingling with the moccasin prints. About fifteen mile or so from the Delaware town, Gertie left his buckskins, and they went west, while he stuck to the horse tracks. I was on to his game in a minute. I cut a cross country for a beautiful spring, but I got there too late. I found the warm bodies of Joe, and that engine girl wins. The snake had murdered them. I allowed Joe won over winds, got away from the Delaware town with her, and tried to rescue Kate and kill Silver in the fight. Gertie probably was surprised and run after he had knifed the girl. Pierce so to me. Joe had two knife cuts, and one was an old wound. You say it was a bad fight? Must have been. The hut was all knocked in and stuff scattered about. Well, Joe could go some if he once got started. I'll bet he could. He was the likeliest lad I've seen for many a day. If he'd lasted, he'd been something of a hunter and fighter. Too bad. But, Lord, you can't keep him down, no more than you can lots of these wild young chaps that drift out here. I'll allow he had the fever bad. Did you have time to bury them? I hadn't time for much. I sunk them in the spring. It's a pretty deep hole, said Zane, reflectively. Then you and the dog took Gertie's trail, but couldn't catch up with him. He's now with the renegade cutthroats and hundreds of riled Indians over there in the village of peace. I reckon you're right. A long silence ensued. Jonathan finished his simple repast, drank from the little spring that trickled under the stone, and sitting down by the dog, smoothed out his long, silken hair. Lou! "'We're pretty good friends, ain't we?' he asked thoughtfully. "'Jack, you and the Colonel are all the friends I ever had, "'ceptin' that boy lying quiet back there in the woods. "'I know you pretty well, and I ain't saying a word "'about your running off from me on many a hut, "'but I want to speak plain about this fellow Gertie.' "'Well,' said Wetzel, as Zane hesitated, "'twice in the last few years you and I have had it in for the same men, both white-livered traitors. You remember? First it was Miller, who tried to ruin my sister Betty, and next it was Jim Gertie, who murdered our old friend, as good an old man as ever wore moccasins. Well, after Miller ran off from the fort, we trailed him down to the river, and I points across and says, You or me? And you says, Me. You was Betty's friend, and I knew she'd be avenged. Miller is lying quiet in the woods, and violets have blossomed twice over his grave, though you never said a word. But I know it's true, because I know you. Zane looked eagerly into the dark face of his friend, hoping perhaps to get some verbal assurance there that his belief was true. But Wetzel did not speak, and he continued. Another day, not so long ago, we both looked down at an old friend and saw his white hair matted with blood. He'd been murdered for nothing. Again, you and me trailed a coward, and found him to be Jim Gertie. I knew you'd been hunting him for years, and so I says, Lou, you or me? And you says, me. I give in to you, for I knew you were a better man than me, and because I wanted you to have the satisfaction. Well, the months have gone by, and Jim Gertie's still living and carrying on. Now he's over there after them poor preachers. I ain't saying, Lou, that you haven't more agin him than me, but I do say, let me in on it with you. He always has a gang of redskins with him. He's afraid to travel alone, else you'd had him long ago. Two of us'll have more chance to get him. Let me go with you. When it comes to a finish, I'll stand aside while you give it to him. I'd enjoy seeing you cut him from shoulder to hip. After he leaves the village of peace, we'll hit his trail, camp on it, and Stick to it till it ends in his grave. 
The earnest voice of the backwoodsman ceased. Both men rose and stood facing each other. Zane's bronzed face was hard and tense, expressive of an indomitable will. Wetzel's was coldly dark, with fateful resolve, as if his decree of vengeance once given was as immutable as destiny. The big horny hands gripped in a vice-like clasp born of fierce passion, but no word was spoken. Far to the west somewhere, a befrilled and bedizened renegade pursued the wild tenor of his ways, perhaps even now steeping his soul in more crime or staining his hands a deeper red. But sleeping or waking, he dreamed not of this deadly compact that meant his doom. The two hunters turned their stern faces toward the west and passed silently down the ridge into the depths of the forest. Darkness found them within rifle-shot of the village of peace. With the dog creeping between them, they crawled to a position which would, in daylight, command a view of the clearing. Then, while one stood guard, the other slept. When morning dawned, they shifted their position to the top of a low, fern-covered cliff, from which they could see every movement in the village. All the morning they watched with that wonderful patience of men who knew how to wait. The visiting savages were quiet. The missionaries moved about in and out of the shops and cabins. The Christian Indians worked industriously in the fields, while the renegades lolled before a prominent teepee. "'This quiet looks bad,' whispered Jonathan to Wetzel. No shouts were heard, not a hostile Indian was seen to move. "'They've come to a decision,' whispered Jonathan, and Wetzel answered him, "'If they have.' The Christians don't know it. An hour later, the deep pealing of the church bell broke the silence. The entire band of Christian Indians gathered near the large log structure, and then marched in orderly form toward the maple grove, where the service was always held in pleasant weather. This movement brought the Indians within several hundred yards of the cliff, where Zane and Wetzel lay concealed. "'There's Heckwelder walking with old man Wells,' whispered Jonathan. There's young and Edwards, and yes, there's the young missionary, Brother Joe. Pears to me they're foolish to hold service in the face of all those riled engines. Wuss and foolish, answered Wetzel. Look, my gum, as I'm a living sinner, there comes the whole crowd of hostile redskins. They've got their guns, and by gum they're painted. Looks bad, bad. Not much friendliness about that much. They ain't intending to be peaceable. By gum, you're right. There ain't one of them settin' down. Pears to me I know some of them redskins. There's Pipe, sure enough, and Kotoxen. By gum, if there ain't Chingis. He was friendly once. None of them's friendly. Look, Lou, look, right behind Pipe. See that long war bonnet? As I'm a born sinner, that's your old friend Wingenund. Pears to be we've rounded up all our acquaintances. The two bordermen lay close under the tall ferns and watched the proceedings with sharp eyes. They saw the converted Indians seat themselves before the platform. The crowd of hostile Indians surrounded the glade on all sides except one, which singularly enough was next to the woods. Look thar! exclaimed Wetzel under his breath. He pointed off to the right of the maple glade. Jonathan gazed in the direction indicated, and saw two savages stealthily slipping through the bushes and behind trees. Presently these suspicious acting spies, or scouts, stopped on a little knoll perhaps a hundred yards from the glade. Wetzel groaned. "'This ain't comfortable,' growled Zane in a low whisper. "'Them red devils are up to something bad. They'd better not move round over here.' The hunters, satisfied that the two isolated savages meant mischief, turned their gaze once more toward the maple grove. "'Ah, Simon, you white traitor! See him, Lou, coming with his precious gang,' said Jonathan. "'He's got the whole thing fixed. You could plainly see that. Bill Elliot, McKee, and who's that renegade with Jim Gurney? I'll allow he must be the feller we heard was with the Chippewas. Tough-looking customer!' A good mate for Jim Gertie. A fine lot of border hawks. Something coming off, whispered Wetzel, as Zane's low growl grew unintelligible. 
Jonathan felt, rather than saw, Wetzel tremble. The missionaries are consulting. Ah, oh, there comes one. Which? I guess it's Edwards. By gum, who's that Injun stalking over from the hostile bunch? Big chief, whoever he is. Blessed if it ain't half king. The watchers saw the chief wave his arm and speak with evident arrogance to Edwards, who, however, advanced to the platform and raised his hand to address the Christians. Crack! A shot rang out from the thicket. Clutching wildly at his breast, the missionary reeled back, staggered, and fell. One of those skulking redskins has killed Wedsworth, said Zane. But no, he's not dead. He's getting up. Maybe he ain't hurt bad. By gum, there's Young coming forward, of all the fools. It was indeed true that Young had faced the Indians. Half King addressed him as he had the other. But Young raised his hand and began speaking. Crack! Another shot rang out. Young threw up his hands and fell heavily. The missionaries rushed toward him. Mr. Wells ran round the group, wringing his hands as if distracted. He's hard hit, his saying between his teeth. You can tell that by the way he fell. Wetzel did not answer. He lay silent and motionless, his long body rigid, and his face like marble. There comes the other young fellow, Joe's brother. He'll get plugged, too, continued Zane, whispering rather to himself than to his companion. Oh, I hope they'd show some sense. It's noble for them to die for Christianity, but he won't do no good. By gum, Heckwelder has pulled him back. Now that's good judgment. Half King stepped before the Christians and addressed them. He held in his hand a black war club, which he wielded as he spoke. Jonathan's attention was now directed from the maple grove to the hunter beside him. He had heard a slight metallic click as Wetzel cocked his rifle. Then he saw the black barrel slowly rise. Listen, Lou, maybe it ain't good sense. We're after Gertie, you remember, and it's a long shot from here, full three hundred yards. You're right, Jack, you're right, answered Wetzel, breathing hard. Let's wait and see what comes off. Jack, I can't do it. It'll make our job harder, but I can't help it. I can put a bullet just over the Huron's left eye, and I'm going to do it. You can't do it, Lou, you can't. It's too far for any gun. Wait, wait, whispered Jonathan, laying his hand on Wetzel's shoulder. Wait, man, can't you see what that unnameable villain is doing? What? asked Zane, turning his eyes again to the glade. The converted Indian sat with bowed heads. Half King raised his war club and threw it on the ground in front of them. He's announcing the death decree, hissed Wetzel. Well, if he ain't. Jonathan looked at Wetzel's face. Then he rose to his knees, as had Wetzel, and tightened his belt. He knew that in another instant they would be speeding away through the forest. Lou, my rifle's no good for that distance, but maybe yours is. You ought to know. It's not sense, because there's Simon Gertie and there's Jim, the men we're after. If you can hit one, you can another. But go ahead, Lou, plug that cowardly redskin. Wetzel knelt on one knee and thrust the black barrel forward through the fern leaves. Slowly the fatal barrel rose to a level and became as motionless as the immovable stones. Jonathan fixed his keen gaze on the haughty countenance of Half King as he stood with folded arms and scornful mien in front of the Christians he had just condemned. Even as the short stinging crack of Wetzel's rifle broke the silence, Jonathan saw the fierce expression of Half King's dark face changed to one of vacant wildness. His arms never relaxed from their folded position. He fell as falls a monarch of the forest trees, a dead weight. End of chapter 24 of The Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio Five of the Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Leonard Wilson. Chapter Twenty Five. Please do not preach today," said Nell, 
raising her eyes imploringly to Jem's face. Nellie, I must conduct the services as usual. I cannot shirk my duty, nor let these renegades see I fear to face them. I have such a queer feeling. I am afraid. I don't want to be left alone. Please do not leave me. Jem strode nervously up and down the length of the room. Nell's worn face, her beseeching eyes, and trembling hands touched his heart. Rather than almost anything else, he desired to please her, to strengthen her. Yet how could he shirk his duty? Nellie, what is it you fear? he asked, holding her hands tightly. Oh, I don't know what, everything. Uncle is growing weaker every day. Look at Mr. Young. He is only a shadow of his former self, and this anxiety is wearing Mr. Heckwelder out. He is more concerned than he dares admit. You needn't shake your head, for I know it. Then those Indians who are waiting, waiting, for God only knows what. Worse than all to me, I saw that renegade, that fearful beast who made away with poor dear Kate. Nell burst into tears and leaned sobbing on Jem's shoulder. "'Nell, I've kept my courage only because of you,' replied Jem, his voice trembling slightly. She looked up quickly. Something in the pale face which was bent over her told that now, if ever, was the time for a woman to forget herself and to cheer, to inspire those around her. "'I am a silly baby and selfish,' she cried, freeing herself from his hold always thinking of myself. She turned away and wiped the tears from her eyes. Go, Jim, do your duty. I'll stand by and help you all a woman can. The missionaries were consulting in Heckwelder's cabin. Zeisberger had returned that morning, and his aggressive, dominating spirit was just what they needed in an hour like this. He raised the downcast spirits of the ministers. Hold the service, I should say we will, he declared, waving his hands. What have we to be afraid of? I do not know, answered Heckwalder, shaking his head doubtfully. I do not know what to fear. Gertie himself told me he bore us no ill will, but I hardly believe him. All this silence, this ominous waiting perplexes, bewilders me. Gentlemen, our duty at least is plain, said Jem impressively. The faith of these Christian Indians in us is so absolute that they have no fear. They believe in God and in us. These threatening savages have failed signally to impress our Christians. If we do not hold the service, they will think we fear Gertie, and that might have a bad influence. I am in favor of postponing the preaching for a few days. I tell you, I am afraid of Gertie's Indians, not for myself, but for these Christians whom we love so well. I am afraid. Heckwelder's face bore testimony to his anxious dread. You are our leader. We have but to obey, said Edwards. Yet I think we owe it to our converts to stick to our work until we are forced by violence to desist. Ah, what form will that violence take? cried Heckwelder, his face white. You cannot tell what these savages mean. I fear, I fear. Listen, Heckwelder, you must remember we had this to go through once before, put in Zeisberger earnestly. In seventy-eight, Gertie came down on us like a wolf on the fold. He had not so many Indians at his beck and call as now, but he harangued for days, trying to scare us and our handful of Christians. He set his drunken fiends to frighten us, and he failed. We stuck it out and won. He's trying the same game. Let us stand against him and hold our services as usual. We should trust in God. Never give up, cried Jim. Gentlemen, you are right. You shame me, even though I feel that I understand the situation and its dread possibilities better than any one of you. Whatever befalls, we'll stick to our post. I thank you for reviving the spirit in my cowardly heart. We will hold the service today as usual, and to make it more impressive, each shall address the congregation in turn. And if need be, we will give our lives for our Christians, said Young, raising his pale face. The deep, mellow peals of the church bell awoke the slumbering echoes. Scarcely had its melody died away in the forest 
when a line of indians issued from the church and marched toward the maple grove men women youths maidens and children glickhican the old delaware chief headed the line his step was firm his head erect his face calm in its noble austerity his followers likewise expressed in their countenances the steadfastness of their belief the maidens heads were bowed but with shyness not fear the children were happy their bright faces expressive of the joy they felt in the anticipation of listening to their beloved teachers this procession passed between rows of painted savages standing immovable with folded arms and somber eyes no sooner had the christians reached the maple grove when from all over the clearing appeared hostile indians who took positions near the knoll where the missionaries stood eckewelder's faithful little band awaited him on the platform the converted indians seated themselves as usual at the foot of the knoll the other savages crowded closely on both sides they carried their weapons and maintained the same silence that had so singularly marked their mood of the last twenty-four hours no human skill could have divined their intention this coldness might be only habitual reserve and it might be anything else heckewelder approached at the same time that simon girty and his band of renegades appeared with the renegades were pipe and half king these two came slowly across the clearing passed through the opening in the crowd and stopped close to the platform heckewelder went hurriedly up to his missionaries he seemed beside himself with excitement and spoke with difficulty do not preach to-day i have been warned again he said in a low voice do you forbid it inquired edwards no no i have not that authority but i implore it wait wait until the indians are in a better mood edwards left the group and stepping upon the platform faced the christians at the same moment half king stalked majestically from before his party he carried no weapon save a black knotted war club a surging forward of the crowd of savages behind him showed the intense interest which his action had aroused he walked forward until he stood halfway between the platform and the converts he ran his evil glance slowly over the christians and then rested it upon edwards half king's orders are to be obeyed let the pale face keep his mouth closed he cried in the indian tongue the imperious command came as a thunderbolt from a clear sky the missionaries behind edwards stood bewildered awaiting the outcome but edwards without a moment's hesitation calmly lifted his hand and spoke beloved christians we meet to-day as we have met before as we hope to meet in spain the whistling of a bullet over the heads of the christians accompanied the loud report of a rifle all present plainly heard the leaden missile strike edwards wheeled clutching his side breathed hard and then fell heavily without uttering a cry he had been shot by an indian concealed in the thicket for a moment no one moved nor spoke the missionaries were stricken with horror the converts seemed turned to stone and the hostile throng waited silently as they had for hours he shot he shot oh i feared this cried heckewelder running forward the missionaries followed him edwards was lying on his back with the bloody hand pressed to his side dave dave how is it with you asked heckewelder in a voice low with fear not bad it's too far out to be bad but it knocked me over answered edwards weakly give me water they carried him from the platform and laid him on the grass under a tree young pressed edwards hand he murmured something that sounded like a prayer and then walked straight upon the platform as he raised his face which was sublime with white light pale face back roared half king as he waved his war club you indian dog be silent young's clear voice rolled out on the quiet air so imperiously so powerful in its wonderful scorn and passion that the hostile savages were overcome by awe and the christians thrilled anew with reverential love young spoke again in a voice which had lost its passion and was singularly sweet in its richness beloved christians if it is god's will that we must die to prove our faith 
then as we have taught you how to live so we can show you how to die spang again a whistling sound came with the bellow of an overcharged rifle again the sickening thud of a bullet striking flesh young fell backwards from the platform the missionaries laid him beside edwards and then stood in shuddering silence a smile shone on young's pale face a stream of dark blood welled from his breast his lips moved he whispered i ask no more god's will jim looked down once at his brother missionaries then with blanched face but resolute and stern he marched toward the platform heckwelder ran after him and dragged him back no 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 my god would you be killed oh i tried to prevent this cried heckwelder wringing his hands one long fierce exultant yell pealed throughout the grove it came from those silent breasts in which was pent up hatred it greeted the action which proclaimed victory over the missionaries all eyes turned on half king with measured stride he paced to and fro before the christian indians neither cowering nor shrinking marked their manner to a man to a child they rose with proud mien heads erect and eyes flashing this mighty chief with his bloodthirsty crew could burn the village of peace could annihilate the christians but he could never change their hope and trust in god blinded fools cried half king the huron is wise he tells no lies many moons ago he told the christians they were sitting halfway between two angry gods who stood with mouths open wide and looking ferociously at each other if they did not move back out of the road they would be ground to powder by the teeth of one or the other or both half king urged them to leave the peaceful village to forget the pale-faced god to take their horses and flocks and return to their homes the christians scorned the huron king's counsel the sun has set for the village of peace the time has come pipe and the huron are powerful they will not listen to the pale-faced god they will burn the village of peace death to the christians half king threw the black war club with a passionate energy on the grass before the indians they heard this decree of death with unflinching front even the children were quiet not a face paled not an eye was lowered half king cast their doom in their teeth the christians eyed him with unspoken scorn my god my god it is worse than i thought moaned heckwelder utter ruin murder murder in the momentary silence which followed his outburst a tiny cloud of blue-white smoke came from the ferns overhanging a cliff crack all heard the shot of a rifle all noticed the difference between its clear ringing intonation and the loud reports of the other two all distinctly heard the zip of a bullet as it whistled over their heads all no not all one did not hear that speeding bullet he who was the central figure in this tragic scene he who had doomed the christians might have seen that tiny puff of smoke which heralded his own doom but before the ringing report could reach his ears a small blue hole appeared as if by magic over his left eye and pulse and sense and life had fled forever half king great cruel chieftain stood still for an instant as if he had been an image of stone his haughty head lost its erect poise the fierceness seemed to fade from his dark face his proud plume waved gracefully as he swayed to and fro and then fell before the christians inert and lifeless no one moved it was as if no one breathed the superstitious savages awaited fearfully another rifle shot another lightning stroke another visitation from the pale faces god but jim girty with the cunning born of his terrible fear had recognized the ring of that rifle he had felt the zip of a bullet which could just as readily have found his brain as half kings he had stood there as fair a mark as the cruel huron yet the avenger had not chosen him was he reserved for a different fate 
was not such a death too merciful for the frontier death's head he yelled in his craven fear la van de la mort the well-known dreaded appellation aroused the savages from a fearful stupor into a fierce manifestation of hatred a tremendous yell rent the air instantly the scene changed End of chapter 25 of The Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray. Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio.